ça, les permis de travail fermés et de procéder plus par secteur? Je ne pas ça. Bien, j'ai n'ai pas, pas beaucoup plus à rajouter. J'ai encore à lire le rapport. Euh, C'est clair que dans le domaine, il y a des pratiques qu'il faut enrayer. Euh, mais c'est un travail qui doit se compléter, puis on, on doit con continuer de ré réviser le rapport qui a été mis par le Sénat tout récemment. Je ne suis pas contre en principe, euh, mais il y a beaucoup, par exemple, de fermiers qui ont beaucoup d'investissements qui s'attendent à ce que les gens travaillent sur leur ferme. Est-ce qu'en marge de ça, les, les gens parfois sont abusés? Oui, c'est clair, il y, a des, il y a des instances, mais ce n'est pas tous les fermiers, ce n'est pas tous les agriculteurs qui, euh, qui sont en cause. Donc, je pense qu'il faut être judicieux dans notre approche et, et c'est un travail que je me dois de faire. Je ne suis pas le seul à le faire, j'ai d'autres membres du cabinet avec lesquels je travaille pour trouver une réponse. Quelles seraient les, justement les, les, les difficultés ou en tout cas les, les, les risques d'aller de, vers des permis un petit peu plus ouverts? Bien, risque d'exploitation. d'un, les... Les permis fermés risquent d'exploitation. Oui, oui, euh, vous justement, savez tous, vous avez vu le oui. rapport. Euh, de, de, de défaire ça, ça serait quoi les défaire risques? Défaire ça, le risque que les gens viennent, les fermiers, agriculteurs, autres, qui investissent beaucoup de capital pour s'attendre à une certaine main d'œuvre, qui s'en viennent travailler dans leurs champs, dans leurs, dans leurs usines ou autres, et puis qui s'en vont ailleurs, euh, du coup, qui sont venus. Donc, ça, c'est le risque. Euh, Est-ce que c'est -ce est la bonne façon d'enrayer les abus? Euh, ça, c'est une autre question. S'il y a des gens qui abusent de leurs employés, ça, c'est un, un enjeu de société qu'il faut régler peut-être d'une autre façon, mais c'est une façon pour les, les employés de montrer leur, leur désaccord avec les pratiques de leurs employeurs en, en allant chercher un autre employeur, mais c'est clair. Euh, c'est vrai aussi que ce sont des programmes qui sont spécialisés dans l'agriculture, dans l'agriculture où les Canadiens ne remplissent pas ce, cette main d'œuvre, évidemment, dans, un, dans, dans une période euh, inflationniste. En agriculture, en agriculture euh, j'ai une certaine réticence à, à déstabiliser le marché. En même temps, c'est une question de justice sociale. Donc, n'ayant pas lu le rapport en complet que je vais lire, euh, j'hésite à donner des, des pistes de solutions précises, mais je pense que voilà l'état des enjeux. Parce qu'on se fait marché pour les plaintes des personnes qui mais aussi pour les employeurs. Oui, bien c'est quelque chose à regarder. C'est clair que le, que, que le système présent n'est pas celui qui est idéal. Euh, le Sénat en a fait rapport. Ils sont en a fait état. Ce n'est pas le premier. Euh, encore une fois, là, les solutions sont à, à venir. Je n'ai pas toutes les solutions pour l'instant. Our teams had had some significant discussions with Israeli authorities, including a discussion I had with the Israeli ambassador, who had expressed directly to me that on a humanitarian level they were willing to recognize uh, through COGAT the special measures program that we had put in place in January. Uh, so that was very positive. But then, obviously, events and the the, um, the operations in in Rafah occurred on May 7th, and that has uh, closed the border. So, for all affected persons, closed the program. And anything from Egypt on that front, because you say that yeah, they so same, to same discussion. They were uh, they, they were open to this. They they are obviously the place where people are fleeing to. Uh, so we need their cooperation in making sure people are taken care of while we complete the processing of, of folks that'll get visas ultimately to Canada. Je pense que vous avez répondu à la, à la question vous-même. Évidemment, ça fait depuis au moins le mois de janvier qu'on envoie plus les armes. Euh, donc, c'est clair. Évidemment, la, la, la situation de la France nous préoccupe énormément. I want the fighting to stop. I want this war to stop. I mean, it's just awful the toll that this has taken on uh, people around the world, on civilians in both Israel and in Gaza. I just want the war to stop. Do you think there should be sanctions against Israel for what's happening now? Well, I think that we have to be concerned about uh, civilian casualties. I think we have to be concerned about the ability for humanitarian aid to flow. This is no different than what I've said for many months now or what the government of Canada has said. So I think we also have to appreciate 
in the complexity of all of that, that Hamas continues to be a terrorist organization that operates as the leading body uh, governing the Gaza Strip, unfortunately to the detriment of both the people of Gaza and the Israeli people, and that they have tactics that they use, which include uh, embedding themselves in civilian infrastructure that makes it very difficult for the uh, Israeli military to be able to identify and respond to the threats that still exist towards them. So, it, as I've said before, it's very complicated, but I think I think that we have to be extremely concerned with the civilian death toll. We have to be extremely concerned with the humanitarian crisis that continues to evolve. And at the same time, we have to recognize that uh, the government of Israel uh, and the people of Israel deserve to live uh, in safety and security as well. And Hamas uh, remains, as does uh, Netanyahu, as I've said before, an obstacle to peace in the region. Est-ce que vous croyez, M. Netanyahu, quand il dit que c'était un malheureux accident, les attaques à Rafah? C'est impossible pour moi d'offrir une explication de ça. Je suis pas là. Euh, j'ai pas l'info de sécurité du gouvernement d'Israël, alors j'ai aucune idée. Euh, J'espère que c'était un accident. J'espère que euh, le, le gouvernement, le militaire d'Israël va prendre plus de soin pour assurer qu'il n'y a pas euh, plus de... Euh, uh, c'est casuté, c'est ça le mot en français? Des victimes. Des victimes uh, innocentes uh, au Gaza. Est-ce que uh, vous pensez qu'il devrait y avoir des sanctions à Israël à ce point-ci? Ben, comme j'ai dit, comme je veux, je veux que la guerre euh, arrête. Je veux, je veux que euh, Hamas euh, va être remplacé par quelqu'un d'autre. Re, euh, replacé, c'est ça? Remplacé. Remplacé. Ah. C'est fait. Remplacé. Je suis fatigué ce matin. Rempla <rire> remplacé euh, par... Euh, euh, des leaders qui veulent payer. Et au même temps, comme j'ai dit, je pense que c'est important que M. Netanyahu a, à quelques points, être remplacé par un gouvernement d'Israël qui, qui veut payer aussi. Croyez-vous qu'Israël devrait mettre fin immédiatement aux opérations à Rafa? Bien, comme j'ai dit, c'est compliqué. C'est compliqué au fait que euh, Hamas continue d'utiliser leur... Je comprends, mais c'est oui, leur... compliqué, mais c'est oui ou c'est non. Ben non, c'est pas oui ou non. Ça dépend. Ça dépend euh, aux décisions du gouvernement, excusez, au leadership de Hamas. Euh, ils ont eux-mêmes une responsabilité d'assurer qu'ils euh, arrêtent leur, euh, leur tactique, les actions qui, euh, euh, qui contribuent au... Euh, le, 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 sécurité ou qui, qui pose un, un problème pour euh, les peuples d'Israël, la sécurité des peuples d'Israël. Et au même temps, il y a une responsabilité au part du gouvernement de Netanyahu d'assurer qu'il euh, prend plus de soin pour assurer qu'il n'y a pas des, euh, Donc, dans la situation des actuelle, victimes. Dans la situation actuelle, c'est non, si je comprends bien. Bon, bien, comme j'ai dit, ça, 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 dé, ça dépend, mais c'est pas clair. Est-ce que ne change rien? C'est pas clair parce que... C'est non. Bien, ça dépend... Chaque jour, qu'est-ce qui se passe, qu'est-ce qui arrive chaque jour? Est-ce que Hamas va continuer de, euh, de lancer des, euh, euh, des roquettes euh, vers Israël? Est-ce qu'ils vont continuer de euh, placer les, ces peuples dans des, dans des, des environnements qui posent un problème de sécurité pour Israël ou non? Et, et sinon, ben oui, euh, je, je pense qu'Israël peut euh, finir avec qu ce qu'ils font, mais euh, ça dépend de qu ce que Hamas décide de faire. Merci. Je sais le mieux en français. Excuse, bien, des, des fois, il y a des mots que je ne peux pas chercher. C'était très bien. Merci okay, beaucoup. Merci. Mr. Polyev is promoting the idea that some Canadians are leaving Canada to live in Nicaragua because Canada's broken, it's too expensive. What How you ridiculous think? that would be. Honestly, I mean, Canada is the envy of the world. <laughs> yes, yeah. it just shows he is. I mean, honestly. How ridiculous that could be. Uh, Canada is the envy of the world. If you look, we're a big magnet for talent. You see people coming and coming. People come to study, people come to work, people come to live. Honestly, I mean, this whole narrative that is trying, why would people invest in Canada? Why people would choose to come to Canada? Why would people build families in Canada if that was the case? Let's, at, at certain stage, we have to stop that kind of of rhetoric which makes no sense, you know. To be honest, uh, I think we should be proud, we should be talking up Canada. And, and as Canadians and as leaders, we should talking up. I mean, who could be more optimistic than us as elected leader? I think it's a responsible and it just shows he is. Thank you for stopping. Merci.
family and then moved home to Squamish. And she and her husband, I believe her children, have moved to Nicaragua to find a home that they could afford. He, in his latest X Twitter video he put out about a day ago, what do you think? Nicaragua. I think he doesn't have a clue what Nicaragua is all about. And he's never been there. It shows. What is Nicaragua all about, sir, in your mind? Trust me, I know Nicaragua. We do site inspections or verify that what's in the product is actually what's there. Um, right now, that industry is paying for those things. So it's extremely important that there be some cost recovery mechanism. We vastly reduce that, and we're announcing it in the future. This bill, to come to that, is not about that. It's about killing Vanessa's law. And let's be very clear what that means. It means that right now, Health Canada can recall a tube of lipstick. It can recall a head of lettuce. But this bill would kill our ability to recall a natural health product, even if it's contaminated contaminated with feces or any other bacteria. Um, and I don't think anybody wants their natural health product to have feces in it and not be able to recall it. And that's how ridiculous this bill is. In the second order, this bill would eliminate our ability to be able to go after false claims. Uh, you know, I think it's absolutely reprehensible to say to somebody who has cancer that you have some magic uh, pill that's going to get rid of their cancer. Getting rid of our ability to address that, I think, is totally irresponsible. So this bill only deals with Vanessa's law, it would be a, a terrible outcome if it was to pass. It would have uh, really uh, injurious impact to the, to the health and safety of Canadians uh, and is rooted in misinformation. And your NDP colleagues on board with you? Well, that's a question you've got to ask for them. I'm not sure. Uh, I've heard some NDP members say, well, maybe we can look at it at committee. But I think this is so reprehensible and would have such an injurious impact on, on public health. I would certainly hope that they wouldn't be supportive. Why don't some changes in the budget as well? regulate these products? Well, in the first order, I've, I, you know, in, we take a look at natural health products uh, that deal with nicotine pouches, which are uh, under that regime. Uh, we are looking to make changes so that we can have a greater authority to make sure that these products are, uh, are actually, uh, when they're approved, that they're used for the, the use for which they're approved for, um, to make sure that um, if we have drug shortages, that I have the approval to be able to authorize very quickly alternatives, uh, as long as they would be safe. So, um, uh, and in terms of uh, the the cost recovery regime in the future, I'm very interested in making sure that we can do site inspections to make sure that the products are not contaminated, that they're, they're, the, the factories that they're being made in are safe, uh, and to make sure that labeling has any adverse health impacts clearly identified in the label. Quickly on dental care, are you confident that the more than one million Canadians who are going to be eligible in, in June are going to be able to access it given that about two thirds of dentists haven't signed up? Yet. Well, look, we're over 120,000 people who've seen service. That's a remarkable number for just over three weeks. And I am, uh, you know, we have July 8th. We have a new portal that's coming. I'm very excited about what that is going to mean. I'm talking to a lot of providers um, that are saying they're going to sign up. So we're only in the opening weeks of the program, and we've seen about 40% of uh, providers sign up. Uh, and I'm continuing to have conversations with providers to increase those numbers. Next month, uh, we are going to be adding uh, those under under eight and persons uh, with disabilities who are eligible for a tax credit. That they're gonna be able and, to and I, yeah, I think that but what I've always said is this is iterative, right? Is that, you know, we're, we can't get to 9 million overnight. So this is why we're releasing cohorts. We're adding new providers. And more and more people are getting seen. But every day you, you see somebody who wasn't getting service before, that's a victory. And so each one builds upon it. So we're not going to see everybody in the month of June, but we are going to see tens and tens of thousands of people. And each of those tens of thousands of people get us closer to the goal of having full coverage. Some folks who have disabilities who don't qualify for this latest sort of expanded eligibility because they don't qualify for the tax credit for various CRA reasons, but yeah. um, you know, obviously, I know you've said in the past you'll get to them in a matter of you know months within the yeah. next year or so, but you also know how important it is for people to get that care and, and how meaningful it is for them to get it right away. And so, what is your message for those people who are frustrated the eligibility? is going to expand in June and they're not going to be able to get the dental care that they are hoping to get out of this program. I'm frustrated too uh, that, you know, for the, uh, the whole life of a disabled person, uh, they haven't been able to get uh, access to oral health care and we're changing that. And I wish that I could do it tomorrow. I, uh, you know, I wish that I could pull the tarp over them and make sure that they got that coverage right away. But that takes time and we knew this from the beginning. I'll give you an example. Pre-authorization, which is going to be so imp important to persons with disabilities. Pre-authorization doesn't come online to November.
November. We had a choice. Do we start giving the preventative care that we can give now to people that we can give it uh, and get dentures into seniors' mouths and get cleanings that haven't been done for years? Or do we wait all the way to November when we're putting in a pre-authorization? A lot of folks with, uh, who are persons with disabilities have complex oral health needs. They're really going to have to wait till November anyway to get some of the care that they need because it will require pre-authorization. So this takes time and that's frustrating. But if you're somebody who's waited your whole life, waiting a few more weeks, waiting a few more months, I know it's frustrating, but you at least know the care is coming. Can I go Last back to question. what you were saying about uh, nicotine pouches and some of the changes in the budget and regulating the regulations for those. There has been a group that appears to be loosely tied to the tobacco industry that's raising concerns about future ministers perhaps abusing these new ministerial powers. Is there, I mean, regardless of where this message is coming from, is there any truth to the idea that this could be abused in the future by a future well, health look, minister? I, 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 the tobacco industry never ceases to amaze me what hole they'll slink out of to try to find any argument to avoid me taking action. Too bad. I'm acting on that. Uh, when it comes to tobacco pouches, we're acting. There are way too many kids now who aren't addicted to any nicotine products sticking these products under their tongues and try to create uh, phantom, ridiculous arguments. And, and look, I, I commend them. They've got teams of lawyers being paid ungodly amounts of money trying to protect their interest of, uh, of, uh, of, of selling this, this deadly, deadly drug. Um, but, you know, whatever hole you're going to slink out of, I'm not interested. Let me be very clear when it comes to uh, reproductive medicine. When we're talking about the provisions that we have, these are, um, th this would have to be where, you're, uh, where there's an adverse health impact that's not related to your approved use. Okay, i.e. in this example, nicotine pouches, which is why they're raising this argument. You would need a completely dishonest, lying health minister to use that provision dishonestly and with no credibility to try to restrict it. It's not credible, and I think it just shows how desperate they are to keep these, this hole open and continue to poison our kids. Last question. Imperial Tobacco, notamment, qui lance une campagne pour dire on est sur la même longueur d'onde. Oui, c'est clair pour moi. L'objectif pour euh, l'industrie euh, de tobacco est euh, malheureusement de trouver des nouvelles façons de créer des dépendances pour les jeunes. Et c'est totalement inacceptable pour moi. C'est quelque chose vraiment euh, totalement euh, désastreux pour les santé pour quelqu'un. Et quand il y a des, je des jeunes qui euh, vont commencer des nouvelles dépenses avec un nouveau produit euh, qui vient de l'industrie de tabac, c'est totalement inacceptable pour moi. C'est absolument essentiel que je prenne action. Last question. Nicotine pouches today. We don't know what products are coming in the future. We don't know what future governments are coming in the future. That's true. Should there be safeguards to put checks on the ministerial power to revoke products from the market that people use for their health? Uh, you, there are lots of safeguards. So as an example, the, 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 the powers that are being sought in this example are when the adverse health impacts are not related to its intended use. So as an example, if somebody creates a product and says, let's take a very specific example. Here's a nicotine pouch. It's great for cessation. And suddenly they create a marketing campaign to addict children to it. Uh, and then it starts killing kids and getting them addicted to a deadly drug. Um, then you have to ask the question, do we want a health minister? To able to take action in that instance? I would say yes. And there's a clear example of a power being used appropriately because the product is being used in a way that was never intended to be used, which means that we never had an opportunity to evaluate the health risks associated with the way in which it was being used. Well, the problem is, and we saw it in this example, you know, let's go back to vaping. You know, the tobacco industry used an innovation with, with vaping to pretend it was about cessation and to create a whole new cohort of people that had nothing to do with toba uh, tobacco that became addicted to nicotine. And because we had a slow process, because we, we approved very slowly, we're very methodical, they can use that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that period of time for approval to create agility to addict 
children to these deadly substances. They did it in vaping, and now they've done it again in nic with nicotine pouches. Now, I'm, I think it's reprehensible that they've done it with nicotine pouches. I think that what they've done there is absolutely disgusting. But the pr and this, this underlines the problem. It's the second time they've used this kind of tactic. So we can't afford for the health minister not to have these kinds of powers. I cannot tell you, as somebody who was with Heart and Stroke, fighting that battle on vaping, talking about what was going to happen, I was terrified at that time that it was going to have the impact that it had on our young people, and it ended up happening. And now to be health minister and watch it happen all over again is a nightmare. And to be stuck powerless, waiting to be able to get the authorities to act, to stop kids from getting addicted, is, is, uh, is it was just so, so painful. So we unfortunately, because of how nefarious they are in their actions, we need to be able to have the powers to act quickly so that when they slink out of some new hole, that we can play whack-a-mole with them as fast as their lawyers create new loopholes. What do you make of them um, issuing the uh, correction on their uh, carbon price analysis? Well, to their credit, they made a mistake and they, 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 they recognize it. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the full analysis, but the fact that they recognize that they made a mistake. Now I'm hoping that the Conservative Party will also recognize that their entire campaign about the fact that people pay more is false. It's based on false premises. Like, false politically, premises. It's, the, it's the horse out of the barn on this one, though, politically. The Conservatives have such a, such a run on, on you guys in the polls. Not that many regular Canadians are looking at what the PDO actually even is. The message is already out there. It's crystallized with people. Do you think, you know, the cat's out of the bag, really? I don't think, I don't think, I think that we still have time to explain to Canadians how this is, how important this is, and the fact that climate change isn't going Way and carbon pricing remains one of the best ways to fight climate change. What what the 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 PBO says that had the mistake not been made, his results would still have been the same. It wouldn't have changed it that much. What do you say to that? I, well, I think he said that they would be publishing uh, another analysis. I, I mean, clearly, if you if you if you made a mistake, the the natural conclusion is that the result will be different. But he says that it still would have showed that given the economic impact of carbon pricing, more, more people would still be getting less back than what they had to pay. I'm, I'll, I'll wait to see his full analysis, because if you include the OPBS and the fuel charge, I mean, obviously the results are going to be different. Do you have confidence in the PBO? 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 Do you have Évidemment, ça, ça, ça change beaucoup de choses. Là, on ajoute le, le prix que les entreprises payent, sur lequel, évidemment, il n'y a, a pas de rabais dans l'analyse. Alors, c'est certain que ça, ça fausse les données, ça fausse les conclusions. Ce que je comprends, c'est que le directeur parlementaire du budget va publier une nouvelle analyse, plus détaillée, euh, et, et je pense qu'on va avoir un meilleur portrait de la situation une fois qu'il l'aura fait. Mais le, c est, c est, ce sont des économistes dont le prix Nobel de la paix, ce sont les fonctionnaires du ministère de l'Environnement, des, des boîtes indépendantes également, qui arrivent toutes et tous à la conclusion que 8 familles sur 10, là où la tarification fédérale s'applique, reçoivent plus qu'elles ne payent en tarification. Le PDO dit qu'il va réviser sa façon dont il a calculé sa deuxième étude. Dans les faits, ça change, je crois. Bien, ça change que le, le directeur parlementaire du budget a fait une erreur. OK, pour les gens. Bien, c est, c est, c est, une bonne partie de l'argumentaire du Parti conservateur, c'est que ce n'est pas vrai qu'il y a 8 familles sur 10 qui reçoivent plus. Alors que nous, c'est ce qu'on dit. Il y, a des normes, il y a plusieurs analyses indépendantes qui le disent également, des économistes. Et là, le directeur parlementaire qui disait que ce n'est pas tout à fait vrai. Mais cette cette, cette analyse-là, ce n'est pas tout à fait vrai, est basée sur des fausses prémices, sur, sur, des, sur, sur une analyse erronée. Et le directeur le reconnaît lui-même. And the Conservatives using it against I'm what sorry, else? I missed Why doesn't the government case. release its own analysis on the impact? We've, we've released numerous analysis Why on the impacts of this. Of, well, we, we, we have this published analysis that, that we, we know, have published analysis that shows that. Though, that his results would have remained the same, that it only slightly I, changed. I, I, I find that very difficult to understand. Like, you made a mistake so, in, in, in so, an analysis, and uh, you're saying, well, despite this mistake, the result stayed the same? That. That flies in the face of what three, more than 300 economists have said and, and independent analysis that have been done by the Canadian Climate Institute, for example, that show that 8 out of 10 
families in Canada where the federal pricing system is applied get more money than what they pay. Did your department play a role correction. in having them issue this correction at all? Had you reached out to them at all? Uh, no, your obviously the department, the parliamentary know, budget officer is an independent institution. Uh, so then, were you surprised by this, or we were? We I didn't know that this was coming, uh, and we found that out on their website. By, when by did you? Well, should they have been more public then? Did you find out about the correction yesterday? No, a few days ago. Okay, but we know that the PBO published this blog post with the correction back in April. It was done very quietly during a very heated political debate around this. Do you have confidence in the PBO's work going forward with something of this consequence kind of just being put out there and not really catching any steam for almost a month? I mean, everyone can make mistakes. And I, I think, as I said, to, to, to his credit, that the parliamentary budget officer said we made a mistake on this and we will be correcting our analysis in, a, in, a, in an upcoming update. Thank you. Are you disappointed? The PBO says that. Canadians are horrified right now by the notion that our democratic institutions would become places where violence, threatened, implied, uh, whatever, uh, is a day to day reality. Um, I know that uh, uh, people in Saskatchewan must be recoiling from this news, uh, that it was kept from the Premier and others. Is, Another uh, fact that we have to contemplate here, uh, but uh, this notion that there can be a gun culture inside of our legislatures uh, is one that uh, obviously everyone should be very preoccupied with. The NDP raised the issue regarding Jeremy Harrison, former government house leader in Saskatchewan. Prime Minister, what are your thoughts on the PBO correcting the carbon tax study? Can I not comment on your thoughts on your government? The NDP are accusing all three of them of creating essentially, you know, um, discourse in the house here and in the house in Saskatchewan. What do you do? You agree that this group of three is doing this? Uh, look, I, I, I want to be um, circumspect about this issue. I would simply say this: that every day that goes by in Canada, we seem to have a new example where people think that some of the loopiest, craziest ideas that come out of uh, the fringes of the right wing in the United States are a good are a good thing to import to Canada. That uh, is obviously something that uh, I reject categorically. I think I know all Canadians reject it categorically, uh, but um, there are some in uh, in our democratic institutions who continue to think this is a good idea to import those culture wars import those populist right-wing ideas into our democratic institutions, I think uh, that uh, Canadians need to stand up against it. Est-ce que les conservateurs vous ont surpris hier quand ils ont voté en grande majorité en faveur du projet de loi sur l'énoncé collégiaux? Mais ce qui me laisse perplexe, c'est pourquoi ils, ils ont euh, fait de l'obstruction. Euh, ils ont euh, clamé haut et fort qu'on doit revoir les politiques budgétaires du gouvernement et maintenant ils vont... Euh, est, on, on est dans un vacuum mais total de politiques, de suggestions, de propositions conservatrices. Euh, ils tentent évidemment de, de venir obscurer euh, toute différence qu'il peut y avoir avec le gouvernement et c'est un contraste. On vient d'en parler avec le, la, la rhétorique et les discours enflammés de droite qu'ils qu qu font en chambre. Monsieur Mekinez, est-ce qu'on est rentré à l'étape des, des, des sanctions contre Israël en raison de ce qui se passe à Rafa? Ben, je vais laisser euh, la ministre des Affaires étrangères. C'est 70, donc le gouvernement conservateur. Euh, les conservateurs disent qu'ils sont prêts à collaborer avec le gouvernement. Pour vous nous en dire plus qu'il y a des discussions là-dessus pour faire avancer ça? On a toujours suggéré euh, la collaboration, donc on ne va pas rejeter euh, euh, toute offre de co collaboration venant euh, de part et d'autre en chambre. Euh, ceci dit, euh, j'ai bien des questions que je vais vouloir adresser avec euh, mon homologue, M. Scheer, euh, par rapport au contenu de la lettre et euh, c'est ce que j'entends faire. Est-ce qu'il y a des propositions qui vous ont été faites, par exemple, sur euh, les amendements à Moi, j'ai lu la, la même lettre que vous. Okay. Oui. Vous attendez-vous à des trade-offs? Ils vont vous demander quelque chose en échange? Oh, justement, j'ai des, des questions et, euh, et euh, 
discuter avec M. Scheer de, ce que, de certaines clarifications. And they put Rafa's burning, and Tor Toronto will burn. And so that is what happened, and it is awful that this is happening. And you consider that hate speech? Jim? I do consider it hate speech. We did have the local police, the hate crimes unit, uh, as well as the sergeant in arms were all uh, involved in terms of us indicating to them that this has happened uh, and uh, that action needs to be taken. But I'll say three things if I can. One is I think the public needs to know vandalism is illegal. It is illegal. Peaceful protest is okay. Vandalism is illegal. How is it late speech? Um, well, Toronto will burn. Rafa is burning. And also, if you look at Canada... Rafa is burning could be considered a fact. Uh, Toronto will burn is a threat. Toronto will burn is a threat. Also, Canada Proud has actually promoted the, uh, uh, the vandalism on the front of my office as of this morning. That is promoting something. One is it puts my staff, uh, uh, the safety of my staff at risk. It also seems to be promoting this type of behavior. So I'm going to say three things and then I'll, I'll answer questions if that's okay. The first thing is vandalism is illegal. Um, and and threats against MP and his or her team is illegal. Two, people need to understand the impact on staff on this, as well as they have to understand the impact on our services. It could be only two people in a riding that's trying to do this, but it impacts 99% of the rest of the riding because we cannot serve them. And the last thing, this is an attack against your democracy. If you are attacking your MPs, based on disinformation or based on information that you, uh, that uh, may not be true, um, it is a, an attack on our democracy. When you are attacking your MP, when you're attacking MP offices, it is an attack on our uh, democracy, and we need to do more to stop this. What do you mean? Okay, so please. in terms of, well, Canada Proud has actually retweeted what's happened in my office. So it seems like, they, I think they said the language, I have to look at my, uh, my notes, but I think they said we are proud <laughs> when in actually sort of uh, putting this on. So I just have to see, make sure that this is correct because I don't want you to, hold on, let me just say. Um, uh, no, so they just, what they did is they just put a photo. I just took the, their hashtag is we are can proud. So I just took that as we are proud. They call this hate speech, like no question what happened at your office is illegal. But hate speech is a very specific crime in Canada. Like, what identifiable group is being targeted by Rafa is burning Toronto will burn? Just like which group specifically? So I don't know. I don't know. So I know the hate crimes unit has come over to our office. So all I'm saying to you right now, it is a threat for us, and that is illegal. Do not threaten your MPs. The other thing is vandalism is illegal. Those are the two statements I can make unequivocally right now. Um, what, whether it fits the true definition of hate speech. I, I can't answer that right now. But you did you have to shut down? Did you have to what shut you down your office? What are you talking I'm sorry. About? Did you have to shut down your office because you said it affected services or could affect services? Well, I think whether we answer the phones or not is affected. Whether my my staff is going to come into the office or not is impacted. Um, so, and how we actually. Um, serve the public is going to be completely impacted. So I constantly, every time there's vandalism or my staff feels unsafe or threatened, I have to work with them to decide, you know, how will we continue to serve Davenport in a way that is safe for my team and their, their personal and physical um, persons are not being uh, threatened. And you say every time this has happened before? Uh, you know, it's funny. You almost try to forget all of them, but it's anywhere between three and five, for sure three. I think it's either four or five times that this has happened since October 7th. You mentioned to this office? information. Yes, you to my office. You mentioned that this information fueled this. What disinformation are you talking about? Look, I just think that when we get, so what I'm doing is, and I can't say particularly fueled this particular vandalism, but in general, we get a lot of calls, we get a lot of letters that is based on incorrect information. And look, I just, I chair our Canada NATO Parliamentary Assembly. I just came back 
back from an international meeting where all NATO countries were talking about the level of disinformation, caught sowing distrust, spreading uh, incorrect information, and what it's doing is it's sowing, it's making sure that people are confused about what the truth are, and people are taking action based on untruths. And so we as democracies are being weakened because of it, and it is state, act state actors that are actually um, uh, using disinformation as a tool to weaken our democracy. Thank you. That's it. Yes. Thank I guess, you. What do you make of you know you know politicians' offices being continually um, protested at or uh, graffiti? Peaceful protests are okay. That is not a problem. Peaceful protests are okay. And I've had peaceful protests. I go out. I say hello to them. I meet with them. I talk to them. Vandalism is not okay. Threatening your MPs is not okay. So I'll tell you, in addition to this, I will walk out. Uh, I might go grocery shopping. I might walk down the street. I will be called a genocidal murderer. You are threatening an MP when you do that. Um, and so that is not just me. You could talk to any number of my colleagues. This is a big issue for a number of, of MPs. And I bet you it's not just within the Liberal team. I bet you it is happening right across um, uh, all political Have you asked for security? Have you asked or will you ask for security to accompany you? Well, first, I, I, to be honest, I don't want security to accompany me. Like, 99% of the time, I'm okay. And I really don't want to get to the point where that is what I need to do. Uh, but I do think we have to be proactive in terms of education, educating the Canadian public about what is peaceful protest and what is unacceptable protest and what is illegal um, action and activity. And then, two, I think we have to be more proactive as a government uh, in terms of how do we protect our MPs as well as how do we protect our offices and our spaces. So how does that look like on the proactive? What does that look like? What materially can be done? Because at the end of the day, MPs sign up to be in office. You sign up for hard conversations. You sign up to be there when things get ugly. So we, what can be done? You know, I'm not hard of hard conversations and anybody in my community will tell you I will get in front of all of them and talk to them about the hardest topics that we have. But we do not sign up for death threats. We do not sign up for our families to be threatened, for our, our uh, for people to protest in terms of our personal houses, we don't sign up for our staff to be uh, to feel unsafe and to not be able to do their jobs. We do not sign up uh, or encourage any type of illegal. Um, so, what could your government do to make you safer? So, here is I, I think that the government's taken a number of excellent steps. So, the sergeant at arms have been involved. There is big budgets around how is it that we can actually protect our politicians. What I would say to you is, it is. Uh, we've never entered this territory before. In Canada, in my personal opinion, I think that we need to do much more. And I think that's part of the conversation that we're having. The right various on this, bodies, on are they investigating? Do you know if anyone, the hate crime unit, you said the sergeant at arms, are they opening investigations to what's happening? Well, um, this morning I had another special constable in my office, uh, and my team is uh, talking to them right now. Hate crimes unit was there yesterday. To be honest, I just received, I just returned back from international travel. I haven't had a chance to uh, be updated by my team, but I will be. Uh, this today. On this particular issue, the war in Gaza, a lot of the protesters who had peacefully protested before say that they were smeared, that they were called anti-Semitic, etc. Do you think that there's a role to play in kind of addressing like the people who are not feeling heard that maybe that's part of why they're acting out in such ways? Look, you're, you're raising a very important issue. So I have mentioned I make it a point to, to meet with people who are protesting against me. I don't meet with them every day, uh, but I'll try to meet with them uh, whether it's every month, uh, every certain time period just to, for me to hear from them and for, for me to be responding to their issues. Anyways, I do have to come in, but I'm, I'm happy to continue this conversation later. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Are you at all open to legislating some kind of age verification for sexually explicit material? A lot of people are taking privacy concerns with ST10s because they said that like, the crux of what they're trying to do here, a lot of legislators uh, seem to be supporting. Are you at all open to changing or, or legislating that and saying the Online Harms Act? With respect to the Online Harms Act, absolutely. One of the key, key features is a duty to protect children and a duty to act responsibly. But there's no age verification. There is a provision, it's around section.
section 65 or 67 that talks about age-appropriate design features, and that can mean different things. What I'm concerned about is, is uh, sort of proposals that might indicate you should upload a government piece of identification onto a website in order to gain access, because that could open up a whole host of economic and fraudulent crimes to nefarious actors that operate abroad. But the notion of ensuring that there's some sort of age-appropriate design is critical. That's why it's in the legislation. That's why we need that legislation voted on and into committee so we can hear some good suggestions. But what is it even going to be coming up? Ça, ça, ça se fait, euh, ça, 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 fait ça, ça se fait de temps en temps et l'idée c'est que ça pourrait se faire davantage de manière plus systématique étant, étant donné la, la rareté des ressources euh, universelles en matière de ressources humaines et de ressources technologiques et la croissance des besoins en approvisionnement du gouvernement canadien en matière par exemple de, en matière militaire, on voit ce qui se passe sur la planète, on a besoin d'accélérer et de simplifier les processus d'approvisionnement. Donc c'est vu comme une personne une façon de simplifier, c'est ce que vous me dites, que de peut-être accélérer. S'accélérer et mieux harmoniser les besoins avec les capacités. OK. okay. Merci beaucoup. C'est moi qui Repairs in Kingston, that's the drawbridge that goes between Fort Henry and uh, Fort Frontenac. Is there any uh, news that you can share with us on repairs to the LaSalle Causeway? That's a great question. Uh, yesterday, the department made it uh, clear that they the, part, the, part, the central portion of the bridge will be uh, destroyed because that's what needs to be done to accelerate the, uh, the return of the ability to, to cross from one side to the other. We know how important that bridge is for the community. The local MP, uh, MP Garrison, is fully aware, fully in touch and fully working with the municipality and the residents to make sure that this bridge is going to be uh, available as soon as possible. When you say the destruction, is that going to allow the, the, the boats that are stuck on the uh, upriver side to actually make it out now and then they'll rebuild it? I'm just trying to figure out how, how everything works. That will be one of the outcomes. It will be faster to make those bridges, those, those uh, boats able to cross where the bridge is currently located. And are we looking at like a Bailey Bridge after that, just a temporary bridge to get get people across, or will they have to use the the further upper river crossing? So the officials are looking at all possible options: a to make it possible for the, the boats to, to to cross the area which is currently closed, and then for local traffic, local pedestrian and six and. and, and and biking traffic to be possible on the, on the next bridge and for any other option that will make it easier for people in the community to access this essential infrastructure. And sometimes your department is not known for its speed. I mean, it is summer, it is construction season. Do, do we see a rapid fixing of this situation or are we looking at it into next winter and into the year after? It will be very rapid. There will be more news in the next few days and uh, we are in touch with the city, the mayor uh, and the local councillors who are doing a very, very good job. They talk to my department almost every day. The local MP, MP Garrison is also very active. Is there anything I missed on this? Uh, I think I got everything. I think you did really well. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank Mr. Rodriguez, you. quickly on Mr. Paulia. I'm standing there with a woman who lived with her husband and I believe her child or children in Cape Breton. And then they moved to Squamish, BC. And then they said they couldn't find a house that they could afford. So they moved to Nicaragua. And I'm just wondering, what do you think about Mr. Polyev suggesting that a, a Canadian, young Canadian family can't find a home that they can afford in Cape Breton, that they need to leave Cape Breton, which you represent, to move to Nicaragua? What do you think about that? Well, I would invite them back to Cape Breton, which is a growing economy, and we've got all kinds of growth happening in Cape Breton, and we love to have Cape Bretoners back. We know that you know, one of the things that I'm most proud of is that they're saying that Cape Breton's actually going through an economic boom at this point, and that they're looking for more labor. and so. Never in my time uh, before getting into this would I thought would I have thought that uh, we're looking at Cape Breton as a, as a place where we need more people uh, to come back and work. And so uh, I don't really I can't speak intelligently about what the housing in, in Squamish, BC. But all I can say is there's a, there's work in Cape Breton to be had, and there's all kinds of people moving back, and it's a it's a great time to, to actually ha be a member of Parliament or a leader in Cape Breton. From, from the causeway up to Chetikamp, is there, a, is there affordable housing in Cape Breton between your riding and Mr. Calloway's, oh, do you think? Let me think about that. 
causeway to Shetty County. Well, it depends which way you take. There's a there's a few ways you take. If you take the ocean, well, drive, you, you may not uh, you well, may not yeah. find ocean property along the the golf courses and things like that. But there's all kinds of for sale signs I've seen over the over the last uh, several weeks uh, to, to months. And you know, uh, I think my family is one of them. There's a lot of them people who lived in Saskatchewan are coming back to Cape Breton because of the opportunities there. And uh, you know, it takes them a, a little bit of a, a time, but they found homes and uh, just to have family members who've, who've purchased homes in Cape Breton over the past year, I've, I've seen that happen and I think that it's a growing economy and people are moving back. So you, you're pouring cold water on Mr. Polios' uh, video that people are moving to Nicaragua because they can't afford Cape Breton. Well, I, I don't have to take a lot of credence in what Pierre Polios says. That this amount of disinformation and misinformation he spreads is kind of his narrative and so what we try to do is say, here's what we know from the facts that uh, I, can, I can relay from from the writing, but so I can't speak intelligently about Squamish, BC, but I can say that there's all kinds of uh, homes in Cape Breton to, to, to welcome families to work in, in our area. And it's a beautiful part of the country as well. Thank you for stopping. Good to see you. Okay. Yeah. Is it pertinent concerning the Official Languages Act? Just so we're clear, um, every one of those conversations that were happening, um, we looked for the ruling from the, from the clerk of the committee. The clerk of the committee ultimately was the one decided whether they were in order or not. Our conversation uh, with uh, Mr. Shampoo and the block is always very positive. We're looking to find a, find a positive way to achieve um, a good outcome on the bill, and we're going to keep doing that. Okay, because so are you waiting for his support on the bill? Because I no, I think we're we we are look. Our our objective is to make sure that. Any bill that gets passed is a good piece of legislation that supports uh, the rights of Canadians. In that case, we want to make sure um, that the unintended consequences um, are not ones that we're dealing with. In particular, um, asymmetric asymmetricity can be a huge problem. So we're working. You know, I talk to Mr. Trump very regularly. And we're going to try to find a way, uh, if we can, to get, end up in a good place on that. Okay. Bill. So what, what would you have wanted from that amendment? Qu'est-ce que vous demandez exactement au gouvernement du Québec? Ben, ce qu'on demande, c'est que pour les le personnel soignant, qu'on parle d'infirmières, qu'on parle de techniciens, de préposés aux soins, c'est qu'il y a une parité entre leur salaire et leurs conditions de travail avec les salaires et conditions de travail qu'on voit juste l'autre côté du pont à Ottawa ici. Est-ce que l'Ottawa n'avait pas déjà obtenu un statut particulier? Ça oui, ben, c'est que c'est un statut particulier qui a été euh, voté par une motion unanime à l'Assemblée nationale de Québec en 2019, mais malheureusement, il n'y a pas d'action qui ont suivi euh, cette déclaration-là. Et en plus, euh, ça fait des années que l'Outaouais est sous-financé comparativement aux autres régions du Québec. Donc, on, en, on demande aussi une, une équité interrégionale au Québec pour le financement. Euh, en soins de santé. Ça serait quoi l'écart, par exemple, de salaire? Euh, il y a l'Observatoire euh, de, de l'Outaouais euh, qui a mentionné euh, vraiment des chiffres en 2021. Là, on parle d'un euh, écart de 781 par personne, par habitant, en Outaouais, euh, comparativement aux autres régions. Donc, il y a un grand écart pour l'ensemble des, de des soins de santé. C'est ça. Euh, mais ça, c'est des chiffres basés sur quelques années. Je pense que l'écart, c'est le fossé, c'est encore euh, creusé. Euh, donc, ça fait, c'est pas nouveau ça, parce qu'en 2019, on l'avait reconnu en, en, euh, dans la motion que en soins de santé, l'Outaouais est sous-financé comparativement aux autres euh, régions du Québec. Pourquoi vous avez senti le besoin d'envoyer une lettre Parce que déjà des députés euh, provinciaux euh, en Outaouais. Oui, 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 absolument. Puis en fait, l'effort, c'est de joindre notre voix euh, aux députés provinciaux de la région de l'Outaouais, aux préfets, préfètes aussi. Euh, Et je pense que c'est une mobilisation qu'on doit faire parce que c'est pas nouveau. Euh, les enjeux en santé en Outaouais, c'est pas nouveau. On veut de l'action parce que là, on est face à une crise sans précédent. Euh, les plans de contingence euh, euh, suite au départ de trois technologues envisagent dans un euh, scénario euh, la fermeture d'un hôpital. C'est du jamais vu. Alors, euh, c'est une crise euh, qu'on vit en ce moment, l'Outaouais, puis chaque voix compte. Euh, donc, c'est très important de, de porter la voix de nos citoyens. On est des, on est des citoyens de l'Outaouais aussi. On vit en Outaouais. On a des familles. Euh, moi, je suis sans médecin de famille depuis des années. Euh, donc, c'est euh, des problèmes qu'on vit euh, au quotidien. 
quand on rencontre les citoyens, on les voit aussi. Euh, ils nous entendent, euh, ils nous parlent de la santé. Donc, c'est un enjeu euh, très important en Outaouais. Est-ce qu'ils font appel à vous comme député fédéral pour régler des problèmes euh, de santé du Québec? Bien, je pense qu'ils veulent que leur voix soit entendue. Et c'est ça, le, le, c'est un cri du cœur de, de tous les, les députés de la région de l'Outaouais. Euh, et évidemment, ça laisse personne indifférent ce qu'on vit en Outaouais en ce moment. Euh, les députés de la région euh, de, de, de la capitale nationale sont solidaires avec nous. Euh, ils ne sont pas insensibles non plus à la situation à euh, laquelle on vit. Euh, puis j'espère que euh, le cri du cœur de l'Outaouais va être entendu euh, à Québec. Okay. Bien, merci, merci beaucoup. beaucoup.